short while ago, the IDF identified Hezbollah terrorist organization preparing to fire missiles, rockets towards Israeli territory. In a self-defense act to remove these threats, the IDF is striking terror targets in Lebanon from which Hezbollah was planning to launch their attacks on Israeli civilians. In the end, Israel made the first move. In the early hours of last Sunday, 25th of August, more than 100 Israeli fighter jets took to the skies with one goal in mind, to deal a devastating blow to the Hezbollah terrorist group. We're talking about a full-fledged preemptive strike with which the Israelis hit more than 40 military targets. And although Hezbollah and Israel have been attacking each other like cats and dogs for months, this is the first time since the fateful events of 7th of October that the Jewish state has mounted an air operation of such caliber. The objective? To disrupt Hezbollah's plans to launch a massive attack on Israel with thousands of simultaneous shells. Do you remember what we told you on this very channel not long ago about how Iran could take revenge for eliminating, among others, the leader of Hamas? No? Well, take a look. However, while it's true that the probability of success for Iran attacking through Hezbollah would be higher, the risks would not disappear. First of all, because although Hezbollah has anti-aircraft systems such as the Misag-1 and 2 or the Zu-23, there's no doubt that the Israeli Air Force has the capacity to attack any point in Lebanon with total E. Well, no sooner said than done. That's exactly what happened. Powerful Israeli intelligence detected that Hezbollah was amassing thousands of shells, preparing for an imminent attack. Because, as we've already mentioned, the danger posed by Hezbollah lies not only in its military power, but above all, in its proximity to Israel. A saturation attack could be catastrophic. There wouldn't be enough time to intercept hundreds or perhaps thousands of projectiles at the same time, which could end up having a devastating impact on cities, towns, barracks, military bases, etc, etc, etc. And this was was exactly the kind of attack that Tehran's cronies were plotting. In other words, Israel's preemptive strike in Lebanon was practically an obligation if they wanted to avoid facing a new wave of civilian casualties on their own territory. And so, wham! More than a hundred Israeli aircraft took to the skies over southern Lebanon to destroy Hezbollah's main launch sites, along with several fuel and weapons depots. It's the steel muscle of Israeli defense. But in order to continue, I think it's important to make a small clarification. The attack was on Lebanon, but that does not mean that Israel is at war with Lebanon. Here the matter is much more complicated. In this case, we're talking about a country that, in theory, is one of the most pluralistic parliamentary democracies in the region. Yet the reality is somewhat different. Because Lebanon is also a technically failed state, where the government is effectively dependent on a terrorist group that de facto controls much of the country. Look at this map. The areas you see painted red are the areas of the country that are controlled by the terrorist group. As you can see, the southern third of Lebanon, which is the land area bordering Israel, is actually a huge base of operations for Hezbollah. That is why the IDF air operations last Sunday were mainly concentrated in this area, because it's precisely from here that most missiles and rockets are launched. By the way, as you can see in the middle, there is a UN Blue Helmet mission, a mission that, in truth, I'm sorry to say, is practically worthless. Although yes, it has served a purpose to make Hezbollah, which has been well protected behind international troops stronger. As you can see, talking about Lebanon is more like talking about two countries in one. In practice, the national government has limited control over its territory. And not only that, the country's armed forces directly renounced fighting against the pro-Iranian Hezbollah militias, among other reasons because Hezbollah is already even stronger than them. So they let them use their territory to do whatever they want, even if it puts the whole country in Jerusalem's firing line. But having made this clarification, let's move on. Israel's preemptive strike did not end the crisis. Shortly after the massive air operation, Hezbollah finally carried out its long-awaited attack, although it was a bit soft. Within hours, some 300 projectiles, including missiles, Kat Yusha rockets and drones, were hurtling into Israeli skies. Although in this case, they were not enough to saturate Israel's skies. So, they did not achieve any objective. Mind you, according to them, this was only the first round. According to what they're saying, much more could be coming in the next few days. In other words, between the preemptive attack of one and the response of the other, both sides claim to have won exactly the same battle. Israel and Hezbollah both claim victory after night of heavy fighting. Just look at what the Speaker of the Iranian Parliament has said. 
They cannot cover up this defeat. There will be a precise and calculated response to Israel, but unlike the Zionist regime, Iran isn't seeking to escalate tensions, although it doesn't fear them. To tell the truth, I don't know where they will see the defeat. But well, we all know how political propaganda works. So, next. Visual politic community, if there's one thing that is clear, it's that things are on fire. Hamas says it has fired rocket at Tel Aviv, Israel and Hezbollah, trade messages urging against escalation after airstrikes. This exchange of fire between Hezbollah and Israel has now rekindled fears that the war, far from coming to an end, could escalate. Among other reasons because this attack occurred at a time when negotiations between Israel and Hamas in Cairo are hanging by a thread. No agreement in Gaza ceasefire talks in Cairo. Process to continue, sources say. Okay, that's the way things are, and this is exactly what has happened in the last few days. But on Visual Politic, we are not a newscast, so it's time to answer two big questions. How will this conflict develop? And what on earth did the Hezbollah guys intend by preparing a massive attack against Israel? Well, we'll tell you all of these things and more as we go on. And pay attention, because in this case, there is a lot more fine print than we could ever imagine. Barking Dog In recent times, talking about Hamas, Hezbollah, and company basically means talking about Iran. So far, that's nothing new. These groups do not move a muscle if it is not organized, aided, and abetted by Tehran. And that is something we cannot lose sight of. I'm sure you all remember how in April of this year, Iran launched for the first time a direct attack against Israel. Some 320 drones and missiles were fired to punish the Jewish state. It was what they called Operation True Promise, although they might as well have called it true disappointment, because in the end, absolutely nothing happened on that occasion. Some old sayings came to mind, such as, a dog whose bark is worse than its bite, or also, much ado about nothing. And that was true on both sides. Well, following the recent elimination of Hamas leader Ismail Haniyeh and other senior Hamas and Hezbollah leaders, as we told you here on Visual Politic, everyone has been anticipating the Ayatollah's response. For days, even weeks, there was much speculation about how such revenge might materialize. Would a direct war be unleashed between these two military powers, or, as is typical, would Tehran use its paramilitary branches to do the dirty work? Well, without yet being able to completely rule out either option, everything indicates that the Iranians have opted for the second choice. And that's where the massive Hezbollah attack we're talking about comes in. But with the intervention of the Israeli Air Force thwarting their plans, the big question now is, will Hezbollah try something similar again in the coming days? And more importantly, could Iran take the reins of the operation to ensure that it doesn't fail again. I'm sure many of you are thinking, wow, these visual politic guys, like good YouTubers, are going to sell us the same old story that the apocalypse is just around the corner, aren't they? Well, no, I'm sorry, I can't give you that epic and exciting touch that we've come to love so much on social media. Because if we did, well, we wouldn't be being honest. When someone proclaims to have won a battle, it's usually because they have no intention of continuing to push on the same subject. After all, if you've already won, why continue? And this brings us directly to another crucial point. In in recent weeks, there's been a lot of concern that the Ayatollah regime would launch a full military offensive. That is, that events could trigger a war in the Middle East. And remember, we're not talking about a rumor off Twitter. We're talking about a serious concern in the White House itself. However, despite this, one thing is becoming increasingly clear. The Ayatollahs may be sectarian, radical, and vengeful, but they aren't suicidal. The Iranian regime is disturbing. It disregards human rights, finances terrorist groups, and threatens to destroy countries. They do all that, but they know where the red line is that they cannot cross. A massive attack against Israel would have very serious consequences, starting with the response of Israel, a country with a formidable air force. As you can see, we're talking about almost 250 F-15 and F-16 fighter bombers, 39 fifth generation F-35s, and a lot of air-to-air -air refueling, air surveillance, and electronic warfare aircraft. All of them suitably modernized, well adapted to the Middle East, well equipped, and with very well trained pilots. An air force of the highest level, a global top 10. And naturally, it's not just about Israel's military capability. In the event of war, that could mean US intervention, which could put an end to the Ayatollah's 
regime. Don't forget that the people in the streets in Iran are not exactly with the Ayatollahs. And do you know something else? No one would come to their aid. All their allies, from Russia to Venezuela, or either tied up with something else, or they don't have much to contribute. So with all this in mind, here's how things stand. Iran threatens with big words, wants to destabilize Israel at all costs, but wants others to do the dirty work. It's been like this for quite some time. Sorry everyone, it's not the most epic story, but it wouldn't be fair to say that something has changed drastically, and that we're now on the brink of World War III. And precisely for that reason, what we've seen this past weekend is rather unsurprising. Hezbollah was the player we were all looking to as we awaited its imminent reaction to Israel's wave of terrorist leaders eliminated in recent months. And that's exactly what happened. They were ready to retaliate, but suddenly all their preparations came crashing down with a swift and massive move by the Israelis. As we've already told you, Israel managed to attack at least 40 military targets in southern Lebanon, and they did it like they were quite at home, without resistance, without casualties, and without any difficulty whatsoever. Now let's stop for a moment and ask ourselves a question. What was Hezbollah really looking for with this major attack? Because apparently, on top of causing civilian casualties, their main objective was to attack several military bases. Among them, the Glilot base, north of Tel Aviv, where the headquarters of the Mossad and other intelligence services are located. But was that really the objective? To attack military bases inside Israel that they would probably never have reached because of Israel's strong anti-aircraft protection? Well, pay attention because this is where the story gets really interesting. What we've seen in the last few days was perhaps not a full-fledged military operation, but rather a political maneuver to prevent the war in Gaza from coming to an end. We could be talking not about a major attack, but above all, about a major political sabotage. Now what exactly are we referring to? Well, we're about to tell you all about it. That the war does not stop. In October 2023, when Hamas launched the most devastating attack on the Jewish population since Nazi times, the Middle East was about to change forever. Following the Abraham Accords, which normalized political relations between Israel and several Muslim countries, the final rapprochement with Saudi Arabia was about to take place. That would have been a turning point, a real turning point that would have completely changed politics in the region and would probably have put an end to the political strength of Palestine and many of its historical claims. And this is precisely precisely why one of the main objectives of the Hamas attack was to halt this process. Because behind every action, there is always an objective. Wars are fought for victories, not for simple revenge. So the question that arises here is very clear. What the hell was Hezbollah looking for last Sunday? Had its attack succeeded, it would almost certainly have unleashed open warfare with Israel. Well, as I told you at the beginning of this video, right now Hamas and Israel are holding talks in Egypt to try to reach a ceasefire agreement in the Gaza war. For weeks now, Representatives of both Hamas and Israel have been negotiating the terms of a possible armistice with the mediation of Egypt and Qatar. In theory, the Hamas organization was willing to release the remaining hostages, some 70 people, in exchange for the withdrawal of Israeli troops from certain key areas of Gaza. However, although the talks seemed to be progressing at a good pace, a monumental obstacle soon emerged. We're talking about the Philadelphia Corridor. And many of you will ask, what the heck is that? Well, let me explain it to you. The Philadelphia Corridor is a border patrol route recently created by the Israeli army during its latest occupation of the Gaza Strip. We're talking about a strip 14 kilometers long and about 100 meters wide that used to be under Egyptian control, but is now in the hands of the IDF. It's the point through which Hamas conducts the vast majority of its smuggling with the rest of the world. And as a result, Netanyahu's cabinet has steadfastly refused to hand control of the area back to Cairo, and this has become one of the latest stumbling blocks in the current negotiations. And that came just this past Sunday, when the United States, Israel, Egypt, and Qatar were to reach a common agreement on what to do with this corridor. In fact, just a few days ago, US Secretary of State Antony Blinken raised the possibility of creating a joint Egyptian-Israeli force to administer this border area. That was to be the big step towards the long-awaited ceasefire. But now, following the Hezbollah offensive, everything could be delayed or even frozen again. Among other things, because Hamas can hardly accept a ceasefire while 
Israel attacks Hezbollah. That would mean losing Iranian support and breaking this strange alliance. For this reason, many analysts believe that the choice of Sunday 25th of August to try to launch their own revenge operation was nothing more than a clear sabotage of a possible ceasefire. The war was initially between Hamas and Israel, but for weeks now, Hezbollah has greatly increased its attacks in northern Israel. It's something akin to fueling a fire that was about to be extinguished. To look for Israel to get out of hand again, to heighten its demand, and for this to derail any way the solution of the conflict. And in a way, this might be what's happening. The increasing intrusions and threats from Hezbollah and Iran led Israel to launch a major operation in the West Bank this past Wednesday, August 28th, to dismantle arms smuggling networks. During the operation, the Israelis killed 10 Hamas members and made dozens of arrests. Of course, this is significantly escalating tensions. The risk of an escalation in the West Bank is higher than ever. And it appears that not only Hamas, but also Hezbollah and Iran are working toward that end. The worse, the better. Visual Politic community, we are just a few weeks away from the one year anniversary of the start of this war. Fortunately, for now, the large Air Force operation seems to have saved the northern Israeli towns from a real tragedy. The question is, will Hezbollah achieve its goal of blowing up the peace talks? What will be its next step? All of us here on Visual Politic will be watching closely, but for now, the questions are for all of you. What would you do to put an end once and for all to the war in Gaza? If you were Netanyahu, what would you do with Hezbollah? Hezbollah. Leave us your thoughts in the comments and let's start a debate. And of course, if this video has given you some crucial information, be sure to like and subscribe to Visual Politic if you haven't already done so. All the best, see you next time.